we're going through the, the book of Revelation. And we're seeing that the book of Revelation is a prophecy given to the Apostle John to tell the seven churches of Asia particularly things which must shortly come to pass. Things which must shortly come to pass that will serve to vindicate the it is finished of Jesus at the cross. And also to, to point out the ultimate things to come which involve Jesus coming back bodily to judge the world and make a new heavens and a new earth. But what I've been proclaiming to you is that I believe that most of the book of Revelation is about what it says about things that must shortly come to pass. And that is the judgment that God brings to the Roman army on unbelieving Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. Because the continuation of the Old Testament system, which intrinsically said, it is not yet finished, after it had already been finished at the cross, when Jesus cried out, it is finished, was a satanic lie that God was going to overcome. The unbelieving Jews, and this is not anti-Semitic because we've all had our bad stories. We've all been guilty of, of harming others as people groups. They were the primary persecutor of the church during the, this time in the Roman Empire. And God was going to vindicate his people who kept being told, no, it ain't. No, it's not. It's not finished. It's not finished. It's not finished. And, and would vindicate Jesus himself, who was the object of the ridicule. No, it's not finished. It's not finished. You still need to do the sacrifices. It's not finished. It's not finished. And God, through Jesus' resurrection, said, yes, it is. Through the ascension and enthronement of Jesus, said, yes, it is. Through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost upon the church, God said, yes, it is. And in this other ripple of the finished work of Jesus would vindicate Christ once again and say, yes, it is finished. Amen. And so in this passage, we are in the third letter of Jesus to, uh, to the, or actually the fourth, one, two, three, four, the fourth letter of Jesus to the fourth church in Asia Minor during the Roman Empire in the first century. And this is the church in the city called Thyatira. Now, a few things for you to know about Thyatira. Uh, it, was, it was a city that in times past had served as kind of the cannon fodder and military buffer for the larger city and kingdom of Pergamum. So these were the outposts. They were on a vulnerable plain between two valleys. There was a, it was a place that people would come through all the time. And if you were a conquering nation to come in and fight against the, the people of Pergamum, you would have to go through... Thyatira. So it was created as a military outpost, but it wasn't a strategic place. It was just the first place people would come to. They didn't have any higher elevation that was advantageous. They were just stuck, vulnerable, but they had to kind of beef up and train hard and get some good fortification. But they, they were conquered and repopulated and rebuilt over and over and over again. They were like the bullied kid on the playground. They were a weak city. Now, the things that made them uh, vulnerable during times of war made them actually very advantageous to prosper during times of peace, like the Pax Romana that was happening at this time, Augustus and following, so that they, were, uh, they actually served as a great commercial center now. Uh, they were known for commerce and craftsmanship, and they were the city that had the most pagan trade guilds, or the, the, the most numerous trade guilds in the empire, or in this region at least. They had trade guilds, kind of like, maybe like trade unions or something for different crafts. And, but in order to be a member of this trade guild through which all the main commerce was conducted, you had to participate in certain pagan ceremonies, in, which involved emperor worship and also worship of the kind of god of the city, which was a combination of Apollo and this guy named Terumnos, who was a, a, a warrior hero with a big battle axe on a horse, but it seemed to have something to do with the, the, bron the bronze that was made there. They were known particularly for their making of bronze. And what's interesting is, as Jesus says specific things to each different church of each different city of these seven cities, you can almost know more about the city by reading back into it. You know, by seeing what Jesus says that's very unique to each city, you almost, that's almost archaeological evidence itself 
to teach you about the, sp the, sp the specifics of that particular town. Because everything Jesus says is very much honed to that particular city, showing once again, I know you. It's kind of like, an, almost like if Jesus said, I, I, you know, I know you, Grace Church for All Nations, um, on Memorial Drive, da, da, da. Like he's making almost specifically local references to show, I know you. This isn't just a general letter. This is you guys. I know you. Now what's sad and kind of scary is he's actually going to start referring to a specific individual that he's rebuking here. Right? That's kind of scary. But he knows them. So it was a place that was known for its trade guilds. They were famous for their um, quote-unquote purple and purple garments, which um, one archaeologist actually said the word purple was used kind of loosely colored. Color terms were used loosely. Um, so when we read that Lydia, who was from Thyatira in the book of Acts, and who was living in Philippi at the time, was from Thyatira, and she was a seller of purple, then most likely, this is kind of a side note, just saying, uh, it was most likely a, a bright red <clears throat> that was made not like the purple was made from certain shellfish or certain fish, but was actually from something called the matter root that was, that was specifically from that region of Thyatira. They, they were known, it was almost like their copyrighted color. Someone was talking recently about restaurants having copyrighted color, like a certain red that's for this particular restaurant. Thi there was a Thyatiran red, in a sense, um, that was also called purple. Um, so this is what they were known for. Bronze, fabrics, dyes, other goods as well. They were a crafty city. They were, known, they were known for all the things they made. But if you were a Christian, you were cut off from the prosperity that this city was now enjoying and beginning to enjoy, and it would later enjoy even more deeply in the Roman Empire. Because if you wanted to be faithful to Jesus, you could not be a member of these trade guilds. You couldn't. Because the, the rituals of these trade guilds involved offering incense to the emperor, eating things sacrificed to idols in an actual ceremony, not just you went to the market, bought, bought a good steak, and it happened to have been offered in some weird sacrifice, and Paul says, you're free in the Lord, you know, ask no question for conscience sake, for someone, at someone's house. It's not intrinsically sinful to eat a piece of steak that someone did something religious with. That cow can't help it, and you can't help it, right? But if you're in the ceremony eating it, it means something completely different, and, and, you, and that is renouncing Jesus to do such a thing. So, but it also involves sexual immorality, which you can quite easily gather from all the stuff that was just said. I don't know all the details, and we probably don't need to know all the details, but they would do crazy wild stuff together, have a party, and that was part of the deal for being part of this trade guild. That's what would give you access to this tremendous prosperity of this Roman Empire city. But if you were faithful to Jesus, you were cut off from that. And you had to, as it were, labor outside the camp, off to the side. And so they may not have been lopping your head off for Jesus, but you had to face your family that you couldn't provide very well for on a regular basis because you were being faithful to Jesus. That's what was going on here. Let's look at how Jesus introduces himself to the church in Thyatira. It says, verse 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira right now, remember, angel is not talking about, in my opinion, it's not talking about an angelic being. It's talking about the word angel is messenger. And this is talking to the main preacher or teacher of this actual church in Asia Minor in the first century Roman Empire. Their pastor, their preacher, their one of their leaders. So to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things says the Son of God. Jesus is nowhere else in the entire book of Revelation called the Son of God. And this phrase, Son of God, I believe, was emphasized by Jesus in direct contrast to the claims that both uh, the emperor was the Son of God and that this Terimnos was a son of God, or son of Zeus. They were both called, you know, Zeus was like the main god for them. So the emperor and this idol in the city of Thyatira were both referred to as the son of God. And Jesus is like, no, this is the real son of God talking. <laughs> I'm the son of God. They're not. And then he says this, who has eyes like a flame of fire, 
as Bobby mentioned earlier. These descriptions of eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze or brass, these come out of Daniel. Remember I said that Revelation is like a, a fireworks finale? It's the climax of prophecy. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, the last season of the series, in a sense. And so there's constant references to prophetic images throughout the rest of Scripture and throughout redemptive history. And so uh, these images of Jesus that were mentioned earlier and described all in one in chapter 1 are, um, are now being kind of divided up for each city. And he says, who has eyes like a flame of fire. Later on, he's going to say that all the churches may know that I see into the hearts and minds. I search the hearts and minds. Nothing stays in Vegas and nothing stays hidden from Jesus. There is no such thing as a secret from God. And God went to Adam, you know, where are you? You know, was God literally ignorant of where Adam and Eve were when they were hiding in the garden? <clears throat> he can see through the trees and he can see through your fig leaves. <laughs> he can see through your lies. He knows our hearts. He knows our minds. Before a word is on our tongue. He knows each one. All things are naked and open to God who sees. Eyes like a flame of fire. Pure, fervent, powerful searching. Purifying, discerning. And what does he say about his feet? Verse 18 again, and his feet like fine brass, shiny, bright, but heavy, powerful, weighty brass. Now, these images of like rays of light and shining brass, uh, some of the things I've read said that it seems likely that those were actually descriptions given of Apollo or Apollo Terimnos in the city. Again, he's just like when God rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt. He mocked all the individual false gods, the different nature gods, or uh, the Nile itself, frogs, flies, everything. Like He's like shooting down all their idols in the way that he is judging them. <clears throat> it's like this. It's like, I'm the one with eyes like flame of fire. I'm the one. I am the son of God. I am the ruler, the king, the actual one with all the authority. And my kingdom is permanent. It's permanently founded. He's not wearing ballet slippers. He's wearing, his feet are like fine burnished brass, purified, shining bronze. And that's a reference to their, one of their main crafts. Some people even think that the Greek word used for bronze here is almost like a brand name or, or a speci is specifically the kind of bronze that this city was known for. They're not sure, but it seems likely that that's the case. Because it's not the word that's used all the time for that. So again, I know you, he's saying. I'm the one with eyes like flame of fire. I'm the son of God. I'm the one who has the permanent, firm, weighty, victorious kingdom. So look at his assessment. Verse 19. You know, don't brush by the commendation that Jesus gives. He's going to get to the but, or the nevertheless, but don't skip over this stuff. They were the opposite, literally, in every way of the church at Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Ephesus was really good at resisting the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, kicking out the false teachers. They were like really good at hunting down false teaching and protecting the church from it, as they were commanded to do by Paul, the Ephesian elders were commanded to do in Acts chapter 20. And yet... They, they didn't have love. Like the works that they did at first were not, that they had forsaken the love that they had at first, the kind of works that they were doing at first. And, and Jesus said, consider the first works and repent and look at how far, you, far you've fallen. But now Thyatira, they're the opposite. Look at what he says. He heaps word upon word. Verse 19, I know your works, love, service, Faith and your patience, and that is like patient endurance, that it implies probably some persecution going on. You know, think about how hard it is to find a job in this economy. 
I mean, what if you had something on your resume that just automatically excluded you from getting a job? It was, I mean, whatever it is. It, like you're trying to get a job, but like, it, but in order to, to, to have a good resume, you would have to lie about Jesus like everyone else in those trade guilds was doing. They had to lie about Jesus. That's what they were doing. Lying about Jesus. You had to lie about Jesus on your resume. And because you refused to lie about Jesus, it was extra hard to make money to provide for your family. Can you imagine that? It's not dramatic. You know, one commentator pointed out, you don't get to be like have your head lopped off by ISIS and like it's on the news. No, you just have to face your family every night with not enough because you're trying to be faithful to Jesus and, you're, and his calling on your life. That's hard. And that's what they were dealing with. They were enduring. They were persevering. And Jesus said, this is awesome. And he said, your love, and look at how he, how he talks about their works. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. They're the opposite of Ephesus. They are rocking and rolling in their love game. <laughs> they are serving one another. They are doing awesome. They are, they are, if you were gonna, if there was a reality show of their life, you would watch that show and be like, man, those people love each other. It's beautiful. See, it's not all bad, you see? And Jesus was commending those works. You know, they will know that you're my disciples by your love. The non-believers could look at those people and be like, they love Jesus. But what was wrong? They were tolerant. That's what was wrong. This is a tolerant church. They were tolerant of some woman. Now, her name probably wasn't Jezebel. Jesus is using this name, referring, calling her Jezebel, referring to the wicked, pagan wife of King Ahab or Ahaz. Ahaz or Ahab? Ahab? Ahaz? I can't remember. One of those A kings. Uh, and, the, and she led people to worship Baal. She led people to engage in sexual immorality and eat things off. I mean, she did all that stuff back in the day and led people astray into idolatry. And so there's this woman who has set herself up as, as, a, as a person of influence in this church, and she is teaching people that, you know what, it's actually okay. And, and there's, she's sophisticated. See, remember how Paul says to the church in Corinth, I'm concerned for you. I don't want you to be uh, seduced by the subtlety of the devil and be moved away from the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. See, sometimes we can think we're so sophisticated. Like those people who see everything in black and white. I mean, don't they know that it's more complicated than that? Now, in some cases, that's, a, that's accurate to say that, right? But in some cases, it's not more complicated than that. It's actually pretty simple. You either call on the Lord Jesus Christ and worship Him, or you, or you bow down to an idol and pretend it's okay and justify it in your mind. Amen. And so they were being tempted to, to try to get around this and be like, okay, somehow Jesus is cool with me just doing the ritual thing because I know He wants me to be happy. I know He wants me to make money. I know He wants me to provide for my family. And so He's cool with it. It's fine. There's some way. Jesus even talks about the, the, the deep things of Satan. That there was some teaching or doctrine called the depths of Satan. And, and uh, some commentators think, and I think this makes sense, that this was a proto or early form of Gnostic teaching that again was saying the body is evil, the spirit's what counts. It doesn't matter with you, what you do with your body because you're going to die anyway. As long as you love Jesus in your heart, you can basically do whatever you want. And the tack on of the depths of Satan thing was this. You should sin that grace may abound. Like sanctification through chaos sanctification through rebellion. If you want to know the grace of God in a deeper way, why don't you sin a lot more? Because, hey, I mean, you could even try to justify in your head. He who's been forgiven much loves much, right? The woman washing Jesus' feet? Well, hey, I want to, I want to do some more stuff to get forgiven. <laughs> if there was a well-respected, loving, kind of mother figure, in the well, maybe not mother figure, because some people seem like they're actually sleeping with her, so... Uh, she's committing sexual immorality with the people in the church. But anyways, some pretty lady, whatever. She, but she's trusted. She's doing good works. She's, it's not like she's got fangs, you know? I mean, she's, she's gotten influence, you know? 
If she tells you, you know what, the Lord, you know what the Lord told me? This is good news. He knows your heart. He knows your heart. And he knows that when you throw that incense in, you're not doing that to the emperor. You're just doing something to get by. He knows your heart. You know, when you do the orgy thing or whatever that is, like, you know, he's, he's patient. It's not that big a deal. He knows that you're just doing what you're doing to get by, to make ends meet. And sometimes, you know, the end just, or the means justify the end. Or the end justifies the means. Yeah, the end justifies the means. And if, like, she was really well-respected, I mean, you want to believe that. Like, think about it, just principally. Guess what? There's a way that you don't have to be poor. There's a way that you can, like, provide for your family and um, still be faithful to Jesus. Guess what? Jesus knows your heart, man. It's fine. Just do it. He's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Come here. Come over to my house. It's fine. That's... See, people point out, and I'm so thankful that they did, that it, it wouldn't be, it probably wasn't as obvious as we want to kind of caricature it to be. Like, we don't want to paint a straw man of what this lady that he's calling Jezebel was like. I mean, they, they're, they may have been dumb, but they're not that dumb. Like, it, it made sense. She had a really sophisticated way of working this out with the depths of Satan and all that. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have just bitten the bait, you know, the hook. And so we, we should beware, less, less, we should take heed lest we fall. We shouldn't be arrogant and be like, I mean, there's some lady saying, come over to my house and sleep with me and let's go and eat some food sacrificed to idols. Like, it, it, it may not have been that uh, obvious at first. <laughs> and so we need to beware and think, well, obviously this doesn't apply to me. You know? No. Because you and I are always tempted to compromise in order to... To, to get by and to be in, on good terms with people. And what this is saying is that they sinned against this woman and those following her and the rest of the church by not confronting her. That the most loving thing to do would not to be to tolerate her in her teaching, but to judge her. Now, think of the, the parable uh, of, the, of the wheat and the tares. Because I want you to think about that in the back of your mind as we look at the warning. Jesus said that, you know, there was a the kingdom of heaven is like a field, and you know the, the farmer planted good wheat in there, but then an enemy came in the middle of the night and threw some weed seeds in there. Not the Bob Marley weed seeds, but whatever. <laughs> Other kind of weed seeds in there. Maybe I don't And sorry. I just thought, you're awake, come on. So, uh, so the weeds were growing up with the wheat, and, and Jesus said, you know, he, the farmer isn't going to come out there and cut it all down because he doesn't want to, to try to get, if you try to tear, take out the tares, you're going to, to take out the weeds, you're going to mess up the wheat. And so he's going to just let it all grow together. And then at the end, he's going to sort it all out in the end and judge, right? But what we see here is a really interesting thing that some situations are so grave and so serious mm -hmm. and of such danger and peril to the church mm -hmm. that Jesus is going to give these prejudgment judgments. Mm -hmm. And he's going to directly act to remove the people from the situation. So look at what he says. Here's his warning. Um, and think of his patience. Look at verse 21. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. The patience of Jesus here. But here's what happens. Look, verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed. Now, the Greek word is literally just bed. It's not sick bed. I mean, obviously, the New King James... Translators are trying to interpret it, and they think they get it right. The implication is it's a sickbed. But I think it's a play on words that Jesus is using. I don't think he's being crass. But here's a woman who is probably literally sleeping with a bunch of people in the church. And Jesus is like, hey, if she wants to get into bed, I'll throw her, I'll throw her down in the bed. But it's going to be a sickbed. I'm going to kill her, is what he's saying. This is Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Jesus who John the Apostle would put his head on, his, ch his chest at, at dinner. Same Jesus who is full of love and mercy. And, but because he's full of love and mercy, Amen. he hates evil. Amen. He hates those who would lie about his love. And so what does he say? Indeed, I'll, I'll cast her into a bed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. 
unless they repent of their deeds. Now he gets just in your face here. I will kill her children with death. Now, I think her children are those who follow her, you see? And that's a, a, a way of speaking, uh, a, a maybe a Hebraism, like dying thou shalt die, you know, dying you shall die. It says, I will kill her children with death. Here Jesus is literally saying, in his providence, just like he did during the times of Israel, when he would send in a plague to wipe out like 24,000 people, read numbers, I'm reading in my devotion God sends plagues in to kill people. Jesus is saying, I will kill her and those who follow her. I will kill them with death. Just in case you got, is he going to half kill them? No, he's going to kill them with death. He's going to really kill them. <laughs> now, what do you do with this? The Jesus that you love and worship, we're going to celebrate that he, he gave his body and blood for us, died on the cross for us. Then in the New Testament, Jesus is like, if they don't repent, I'm going to actually, like, literally, like, kill them. What do we do with that? Remember, our categories are skewed in terms of God's justice. How would you feel if there was someone in your household or in your family or whatever who was secretly abusing people or who was there to do harm, but they looked like they were doing good and no one could catch them and no one could... Jesus is like, I'm going to take care of it directly. I'm going to take them out. Because I love y'all. And I love you too much to let this go on. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you see, that sounds harsh and crazy, but this is the holiness of God. He's the same Jesus who's going to come back and cast all into the lake of fire. His names are not written in the book of life. It's the same Jesus. I deserve to be cast in the lake of fire. I deserve to be on a sick bed. I deserve all that stuff, and so do you. Amen. But by God's mercy, He's hopefully keeping you from doing things in your life unrepentantly that would cause Him to do this to you. <laughs> you see, we're sinners, but we're repenting and believing the gospel. But, and I'm not thinking of anyone, okay? <laughs> Just so you know. But, but if you're thinking, oh, crud, this is me, <laughs> you should be absolutely terrified. <coughs> But the good news is that God brought you here to hear the gospel. That the same king who is going to kill these people, these unrepentant people who are lying and, and hurting the church, hurting his people, these abusers, if you will, he was going to kill them. But it's the same Jesus who died for his enemies. He's the same Jesus who has said earlier in this very same book of Revelation, who washed us from our sins in his own blood. And if you're alive you are invited to repent and to come to Him for forgiveness and to trust in His finished work at the cross. Look at His promise to those um, who overcome. He's doing the wheat and the tares thing. He's like, I know there's this woman Jezebel. I know there's people who are following her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge them. But, but He also says, but I haven't forgotten about the rest of y'all. Like It's not like the whole church is doing all this. So here's what He says to the rest of y'all. Right? Look at... Look at uh, um, verse 24. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Same language as the Apostolic Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. I will put on you no greater burden, no other burden. Right? It's funny, they said, you know, just don't eat things, sacrifice idols, or commit sexual immorality. That was their instruction to the Gentiles, like, Oh, man, they're not doing so hot at that right here in this church. Right? But he's like, well, there's some, right, who are doing well at that. They're not getting with her and all that. So he says, um, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Remember, not only are these people living in the historically beaten up city that was like the cannon fodder, the, uh, the people who are just going to kind of get run over by enemies that were on their way to try to attack Pergamum. They were the bullied city, the conquered and rebuilt city over and over again. Not only did they live in this city that didn't have the best reputation of being stout and strong and victorious, but they were the people who were sort of the nerds within the nerds. They were like, like me in seventh grade. I was, like this, I was like on the low end of the nerd separate social ladder, right? It's a whole other ladder. They are this. And, 
And here's what Jesus says. He, he flips it upside down. He said, You who overcome through faith in me, what is he going to do? He quotes Psalm 2, the messianic promise of the reign of King Jesus over the nations and his providence and an ultimate final judgment. We who trust in Jesus and continue to walk in repentance and faith in him will partake of his victory over his enemies. He says, He who comes and keeps my works until the end, verse 26, to him I will give power over the nations. Who had power over the nations at this time? The Roman Empire, particularly the emperor who was worshipped as a god. But you who worship me as a god, Jesus is saying, I will give you, I will share my power over the nations with you. And he quotes Psalm 2. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as also I have received from my Father. Now, think about justice. Now, when I, I want to say this humbly because I know that my interpretation of certain events may be wrong, but... Um, Laura and I are watching this show, and I'm not going to do the spoiler alert. I mean, I mean, there's a spoiler alert here, <laughs> but I'll be careful. But there's a show called Making a Murder. It's on Netflix, and um, and I know that I don't know for sure what happened. Okay, so I'll just say that I'm not like using the pulpit to like make clear. But there is a man. It's a long story, but basically, there's a man who was proven to be falsely accused and arrested of a crime and spent 18 years in jail. And then after he got out and was suing the police department in the county or wherever that did that to him, he was then arrested by, he was then arrested for another crime. And so it's all about, well, did he do it or not? Did the police frame him? Um, and from my limited perspective, and again, this isn't a thus say the Lord, to me it kind of looks like, just from my own ignorant perspective, that they, they framed him. And so as I'm watching this and kind of seeing the evidence where certain things don't match up and there's certain questions that they just won't answer and all that, my blood's boiling. <laughs> and then there's a, for argument's sake, let's assume that I'm understanding what happened rightly. I'm just like, I want to just take them and just, you know, like, like they are setting this guy up who's innocent. Now, whether this happened here or not, you know that happens, right? There are stories about how certain Counties sell prisoners. They get money. They like throw people in jail and make money off of how many prisoners they have. Yeah. People compete over that. It's, it's real. So there are people who are knowingly convicted of crimes who are innocent, who are being used. Jesus has eyes like a flame of fire, and he knows that. He knows what's happening. And he's going to judge. And guess what? You who trust in Jesus... In some way, and I don't understand how this is going to work, but Jesus said, we're going to judge angels. Those demons that mess with you, you're going to get to be part of casting them into hell. Mm -hmm. Praise Jesus. Mm -hmm. Your name is written in heaven. Mm -hmm. But those people who are unrepentant, who, who attack the innocent, and who get away with it in this life, you get to have part of that desire to bring judgment satisfied. We are going to participate in their condemnation, though we deserve condemnation just as much. It's the mercy and grace of God alone that separates us from them. There, but for the grace of God, go I and was going I. Right? That's what Jesus promises. All these people that are messing with you and, and per, uh, excluding you and persecuting you, bullying you, they don't repent. You are going to are going to help me judge them. You're going to help me punish them. You're going to help me set things right. You get to have a part in this. And it may sound perverse, but that is awesome. <laughs> Jesus is promising this. And look at what else he says. 